a very very good afternoon and a warm welcome to this version of the asian conference conversation on a very important topic india's expanding horizons at peace to the indo pacific today i'm extremely pleased to welcome professor sanjay chaturvedi professor and dean faculty of social sciences at the department of international relations south eastern university captain sarabjit s parmar the executive director of the national maritime foundation and dr prabir dey to this conversation on this very very topical subject friends today we stand at the confluence of what i call five crises one a health crisis which has been induced by the pandemic an economic crisis which the world is undergoing and we in india have our full share of it an environmental crisis imposed by matters such as climate change and many other factors we also have a security crisis the recent standoff at the border uh, in our northern uh, uh, neighborhood has been a cause of serious concern and a crisis of the direction of the future of the world order how is the world of tomorrow shaping up and what is india's role in it all of these questions and against these crises one thing is for sure it calls for greater cooperation with our neighbors and when we say neighbors it is not just the immediate neighborhood but the extended neighborhood and the definition of the neighborhood itself is also changing what was our eastern neighborhood the look east policy had started with uh, the intention to engage with our asean neighbors and now over time the act east policy and now the neighborhood is encompassing what we are, ca are calling in all of us the indo pacific so in this important time in the strategic uh, in this at this juncture as india's uh ex horizons expand the definition of our neighborhood change the act east policy is also sort of getting more and more more into uh, its next evolution one can say which is the indo pacific uh, strategy of the policy for the asian continent uh we as an organization which is headquartered in the northeast of india we have often seen the actis policy as one of the main pillars and planks of the development of the northeastern region and of course our country's relationship with our eastern neighbors and there are five such neighbors which the region shares borders with but a time is also coming now when when it is not just at ease with our immediate neighbors or the extended neighbors but the maritime dimension is also becoming very very important and therefore i am extremely honored and pleased uh, to welcome this very very erudite panel of experts today as we discuss this topic we are also going to be Uh, discussing a book that one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Prabir Ji, recently wrote uh, earlier this year, um, "Act East to Act Indo-Pacific: India's Expanding Neighborhood," and therefore this discussion will uh, not only uh, talk about the topic uh, and its generality and its specifics, but also allude uh, to the book. Uh, that Dr. Sabi De Jo. Uh, our esteemed panelists do not need much of an introduction, but nevertheless, 
I would just like to say that uh, we are extremely uh, delighted and honored to have uh, uh, a certain eminent academic from our country, just uh, Dr. Sanjay Chaturvedi, join us. Uh, he has, of course, more than 35 years of experience in research and teaching, including a postdoc at the University of Cambridge uh, with the Nehru uh, Centenary British uh, Commonwealth Fellowship, and he was also the awarded the highly coveted Levenholm uh, Research Grant. Um, he uh, is a man of many letters, has published uh, many, many journals, many books, and uh, we are extremely delighted and honored to have you with us, sir, today. Thank you. I also have the great privilege uh, to welcome Captain uh, Sarabjit Farmer. Um, he's a naval uh, officer uh, and uh, has served in many, many capacities. Uh, he's executive director of the National Maritime Foundation. Um, and he was at IDSA, but uh, after which he was also part of the core team uh, to revise the Indian Navy's unclassified maritime security strategic document and document. From April 2016 to April 2018, he has been the director of the strategic uh, uh, maritime assessment and document development, carried out uh, regional maritime assessments and completed the document development plan. He has written extensively on maritime security issues and continues his thought leadership uh, as he commands and steers the important work that the National Maritime Foundation is doing. Um, thank you very much, uh, Captain uh, Parmar, for taking the time to join this conversation. And uh, a very, very warm welcome to um, a very good friend uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Prabir Bey. Uh, uh, he is, uh, needs no introduction, but uh, he, uh, all, we all know that he is a professor at the RIS, uh, heads the ASEAN India Center, an author of many, many books, uh, publications, authors, journals, one of India's foremost trade uh, and uh, investment experts. And uh, today we are also going to discuss um, your book, sir, which is um, Act East to Act in the Pacific, India's Expanding neighborhood. I had the great delight of uh, looking and, uh, and reading cover to cover. Um, thank you all very much on that count. Uh, and uh, may I now request uh, uh, Dr. Sachin, uh, Sanjay Chaturvedi uh, to please uh, make uh, some opening remarks uh, on, on the topic, on the subject. Uh, and this could then uh, be followed by uh, the conversation if we request you to moderate. Over to you, sir. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Sri Dutta, uh, for doing me this honor. It is not very often that you uh, get an opportunity to be in the middle uh, as a moderator of two very eminent scholars uh, from whom I have learned so much over the years. Professor Prabhu Day's specialization on a very intriguing notion of connectivity, his work on regional integration, trade, uh, has always been a source of great knowledge and inspiration. And I have always been amazed each time I have listened to Captain Sarabji Singh Parmar, I have been simply spellbound by the range of issues in which he has developed such formidable expertise uh, in a domain, maybe time domain, which I think uh, is going to be increasingly important uh, in the times to come. So thank you very much for your kind words for this opportunity. Uh, listening to you, um, one thing came to my mind and that was I agree with you that we all live uh, in the middle of a crisis. And it is not the, as they say, uh, it is not the only gorilla in the cupboard. Because if we look at the larger context, we are looking at what some scholars have rightly pointed out, a new socio-geological epoch called the Anthropocene. 
which articulates itself in the challenge of climate change. We have the challenge of sustainable development goals. Looking at the ocean, we all know that we are also on the edge of what many scholars would call a new frontier, that is the blue uh, economy. So there are lots of challenges, uh, but at the same time, I also feel that in every crisis, there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity to reflect. There is an opportunity to rethink. Uh, look very closely at the notions of modernity, sovereignty, security, sustainability. So it is also a moment of reflection, I think, for all of us. Uh, now, coming to the focus of today's conversation, and thank you so much uh, for, uh, for initiating this. Because in the very term confluence, there is so much of richness of thought. Uh, in confluence, in the concept of confluence, one sees intersections. Uh, and as I will try to make a point a little later, that the context in which we are all talking about all these issues, they are characterized by very important intersections. Now, let me come to a, a, a marvelous book uh, authored by Professor Prabhupada Day, and, and first of all, thank him for giving us this, what I call the archive of insights, and also congratulate him. So this topic is going to be, as he said, the central focus of our conversation this afternoon. Now, obviously, as a student of international relations and geopolitics, I was, I was trying to sort of uh, read between the lines, you know, while reading this book. And what struck me was uh, what we call in international relations the practice turn in IR. So let me let me elaborate that point, which I think uh, is important, because those who read the book also read the book from their respective locations. And these locations can be the locations marked out by our disciplines, by our experiences, and even by sheer physical location. A book of this kind will certainly appeal to scholars and practitioners all over the world, because it is not only the rise and return of Indo-Pacific, but it is also the return and rise of Asia that we are looking at. So let me reflect very quickly on what is called the concept of practice. And I think in this book, what Professor Prabir Day has done is that he has presented such wide ranging practices before the scholars of international relations, sociology, uh, uh, geopolitics, that what we are looking at is, uh, as I said, focus on practices. And we know that there is a constant interplay between theories and practices. Now, to study the doings and sayings of those involved in world politics, diplomacy, and foreign policy, turns out to be the focus of, or the purpose of what we call the practice turn in international relations. So my first comment is, rather compliment, that Professor Day's book is a glaring example of how one of the leading authorities on the subjects of connectivity in Asia, regional economic cooperation and trade promotion can provoke us to think through and theorize by introducing, examining, and even questioning practices. And I think this is what I saw as one of the key strengths of the book, that he takes us to the domain of practices, challenges us to think through them and theorize them without getting caught up in any kind of a theoretical uh, cartographic imprisonment. So thank you very much for that. Ambassador Sham Saran has written a foreword to this book. And I am very tempted, I am very tempted to quote him. He calls this book a landmark contribution, and so it is. He presents before the readers of the book a rich, as I said, archive of insights 
analyzing several interrelated overlapping baskets of issues. To quote Ambassador Sham Saran, and I think this outlines the context very well, the trajectory of deepening all around relations with ASEAN has paralleled India's Look East policy inaugurated in 1992 in the wake of far-reaching reforms and liberalization undertaken in 1990-91. Look East has now evolved into Act East, reflecting the greater salience ASEAN and East Asia in general have come to occupy in India's external relations." Unquote. Now, obviously, the first basket of issues is full of questions. These are of conceptual nature, but very important questions. I think that we need to address and I think we will see conversation uh, on some of these questions. What is Indo-Pacific? What are we talking about and why Indo-Pacific? Is it a new concept? Is it, is it a new concept? Is it a super region of sub regions? Is it an assemblage of strategic geographies or geographs? By geographs, I mean written geographies. And what are the contexts in which we are looking at the rise and return of Indo Pacific? I think that also becomes extremely important. Many scholars have said that new context is characterized by the new great game. And I'm reminded here of S. Jay Shankar's uh, re recent book called the India way from which I'll be quoting very shortly. I see there are four contexts that I would like to place for the sake of this conversation, just as catalysts. One is the geopolitical context where we are looking at the return and rise of Asia. We are looking at the narratives of great games, new great games, shifting alliances. Then there is a geoeconomic context which has two strands. One I call a rather more benign strand, which is more liberal talking about trade and commerce and interdependencies and so on. And then there is a more aggressive understanding of geoeconomics, where geoeconomics is being seen as a tool of geopolitics. And I think this context will also become very important when we talk about the BRI, on which Professor Day has written some excellent sections uh, in this book. The third would be what I call geoecological context. That as we talk about India's shift in orientation, India's worldview expands, India's understandings of its neighborhood and neighbors expands, it would be extremely important to look at what I mentioned earlier, the Anthropocene, the challenge of Anthropocene, and the whole question, the entire question of rethinking modernity and development. After all, when we talk about this part of the world, the question that emerges before us is, can, can billions in global south, what we call the majority world, quote unquote, develop in the same way in which the millions in the minority world, that is global north, have developed? So I think answers to this question also become very important. And then equally important is the changing geostrategic context. And this is where we find that the old binaries between the land power and the sea power are getting increasingly blurred. So the entire notion of land rockedness needs to be thought through. So when we say Northeast, on which again, we have some excellent sections in this book, the question then, and then also your reference to the Northeast raises this whole question of a landlocked subregion developing a maritime consciousness and then questioning the binary while mapping out the future. So the role of Navy, the navies, the traditional threats to maritime security, the non-traditional threats to maritime security, uh, the entire concept of uh, maritime order also become, I think, extremely important. Let me also quote from Sri S. J. Shankar's latest book, because we are going to talk about Indo-Pacific, I thought uh, we must make a reference to a very intriguing concept uh, that he proposes, the Pacific Indian. 
And I think that is a very intriguing concept as we get into our conversation touching upon the uh, Indo-Pacific aspects. He says, I quote, Indo-Pacific today owes its existence primarily to compulsions of practitioners. I thought it very intriguing. Con quotation continues, the waters are changing as we speak and Indo-Pacific is not tomorrow's forecast, but actually yesterday's reality. He rightly points out that the Indo-Pacific, I quote, the Indo-Pacific may be in fashion as a strategic concept now, but it has been an economic and cultural fact for centuries, unquote. Now, before I stop, let me also say that one of the greatest strengths of this book is the manner in which it maps out this long, challenging journey of India in its orientation. And the question which I would like to raise and then stop, and then we can then uh, raise questions later as the conversation develops, is that as India's neighborhood has expanded, as India's geopolitical vision has broadened, as India's image of itself has changed, all along with its political, economic, and strategic geographies of influence and engagement, what are the lessons? What are the experiences? What are the lessons that India has learned in unilateralism, bilateralism, multilateralism, plurilateralism? all along the way and i think this book provides us many answers but obviously we would like to hear from horse's mouth so i'm sure professor day will reflect on many of these issues as we go along uh, in our conversation so thank you very much uh, now i think uh, i would like to invite uh, professor prabit day uh, to uh, to, 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 to reflect on some of these issues and even go beyond them. And then we can turn to uh, Captain Sarabji Singh Parmar, if that is all right. Professor Dehji. Thank you very much, Professor Chathapuri. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sabya Sachi uh, Datta and uh, uh, um, uh, Captain Parmar uh, for coming to, today to have conversation on uh, Actis to Indo-Pacific and uh, also it comes uh, at a time when you know we are locked into our uh, houses or in offices and we are passing through a new kind of you know, environment this environment is um, to me it's very uncertain there are many many risks challenges and we really do not know what's coming up in the future but i'm sure you know you all will agree with me uh, that uh, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel and you know you, you can see it so 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 as i and now when you look at uh, indo-pacific or india's journey from lucas to actist in the pacific uh, some of the you know practitioners in in the ministry of external affairs foreign office in india you know they you know, it is very well documented you know i i don't have to talk much of it. I'm a practitioner and as Professor uh, Sanjay Chaturvedi rightly said you know, uh, that uh, you know we this practitioner's view is also important along with the theoreticians like he and his several other colleagues who are in there in universities in JNU or South Asia or Ajadapur and we know many of them and they are the great you know, scholar and the practitioners like uh, NMF um, executive director and his director general Admiral Chauhan or many others you know who are contributing on the subjects but I found you know most of the time uh, very very happy with uh, you know kind of a scholar community we have kind of practitioners community we have and all the time you know they are in discussion but while I move uh, to uh, foreign office because for my work I have to uh, many of the time I have to consult with uh, you know, the diplomats young uh, senior level and mid level 
uh, many of the time to listen to them, you know, what they are looking for, particularly when uh, India's, you know, mm, uh, in engagements with in, in the eastern or extended eastern neighborhood. So, so for almost about a decade, you know, working with them, uh, I realized that, you know, the people in the foreign office are very busy people. You know, they are in the headquarter for a very short period of time. Uh, to, uh, two years to three years maximum, you know, and given you know the challenges we have in abroad and also in, the, in the domestically, uh, these brilliant officers, uh, you know, who cracked UPSC and then join in uh, Indian Foreign Service, you know, they need to go into some some of his day to day time uh, to the intellectual uh, part of the whole. The foreign policy that they have been dealing with it. They are practitioners, but they need to read through, glance through, flip through some of the, you know, uh, the narratives that several people, including me, you know, they they co contribute. So Ambassador Samsaran, when he was our chairman, you know, he, he 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 you know he motivated us that why don't you write something in a very simple way, uh, very clean way, and for basically to the people in, in, in the foreign office in India and abroad. So that was actually the motivation for me to take up this project, you know. This, uh, this book, you know, you have seen uh, that it, it's actually, it is not an academic book, you know, serving uh, those who are doing MPhil or PhD international relations. Rather, it is short essays, very simple way to present. I presented, you know, India's journey from Lokis to Actis. To Indo-Pacific, and uh, and while you know, writing it, as I said, that this is uh, this book is great motivation from our former chairman and ambassador Saran is a stalwart. You know, we know him. He's a man of you know many hats. He has contributed many th you know in in our foreign policy. Uh, there is no doubt, and every, everybody, irrespective of their colors and their you know their beliefs, they they like him. You know. So, so when I, you know, when I started writing uh, this book, and it is about a small, small issues which like the BBIN, which is India's, you know, immediate and neighborhood, like Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, which is geographically connected, and then going into Bimstek, South Asia, and then extended like Southeast Asia, even you know many other areas, like you know, I have given my views. Uh, on the Belt and Road Initiatives, how you know, in you know, particularly looking at our, you know, particularly looking at in India and the countries in the developing world, you know, how they can make a benefit out of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, provided China goes through a, a drastic reform. So, so, and also I had you know a couple of chapters which are very new on the subject, like Act Far East, you know, Vladivostok region in the in Russia, and then, uh, you know, some projects that India has undertaken recently in the Mongolia, like refinery, uh, and the Connecticut uh, Act Far East region or sub-region with, with the Chennai, and then coming into the South Asia. So this way, I have, you know, looked at uh, India's journey from uh, basically a practitioner's point of view from Look is to act is to and then Indo Pacific, uh, but certainly this uh, you know for forty essays in the short essays that I have written on over ten uh, important topics uh, of in, like you know as I said that BBI and BMS Texas and many other areas, but another motivation came to me you know like the fourth uh, Ramanath Goenka uh, memorial lecture delivered by Ambassador Jay Sankar when you know last year early last year. And he nicely presented, he talked about the 77 decades of Indian foreign policy. You know. yeah, according to him, is is was actually evolved in different phases. So, and uh, when if you see introduction part of my book, I started looking at those phases that, you know, uh, this, you know, starting with uh, from particularly in the 1991 onwards, I looked at 1991 uh, because of the crisis that we had in in. You know, financial crisis, economic crisis in India in 1991. That's actually forced India to do a reform, and then uh, you know we went through from uh, 1991 until you know 2000 and early 20, and we looked at the whole discussions. You know, the journey from 
look at and look is to act is to in the pacific in several phases uh, one uh, here the one important aspect is the locust is introduced by our former prime minister pp narsimha rao in 1992 uh, precisely uh, and then we went through almost about uh, 2014 when activist policy was introduced uh, but difference with the locust and activist from the practitioner's point of view is that you know, locust is uh, is there uh, but it needs it i mean somewhere it, it was required kind of in seriousness in terms of you know coming up with a you know, dedicated budget a fund to run the project to you know in, in our eastern neighborhood uh, then involvement of private sector uh, some more conversation engagements in the b2b business to business level plus streamlining our whole developmental aid cooperation program that india has been you know doing very very you know, you know extensively in you know several countries in the in the both in the east and the west side uh, and uh, i thought that uh, there should be some discussions about learning from others so while doing you know connectivity programs you know, like in 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 the eastern side like trilateral highway or uh, some of the development of uh, some program projects uh, in maldive or maybe in sri lanka so these are uh, some of the areas where i think that there is still scope of learning from other countries you know, in terms of extending the funding to the you know the recipient uh, more reforms uh, you know. so so i looked at some macro aspects also very minute and narrow areas so which um, i think reader will judge how how you know how well that actually fit into this whole discussion and the whole narrative that i discuss in the book but from my point of view these are very important issues when we look at the one which we are being discussed very extensively in this you know coronavirus driven pandemic like in the pacific and and i see there's a rise and you know quad uh, at a foundation level meeting uh, early this year uh, sorry early early this month in tokyo and many things will be unfolding you know in in coming years with uh, with that um, you know as an economist i look at that is a some scope or maybe a greater scope from economic relations how do we fit into uh, the whole trade investment relations into this Indo-Pacific. Uh, remind you that I have not discussed yet the multilateral issues like WTO or several others. Uh, these, this book uh, are, as I said, that to get the mind of the young uh, um, diplomats working in Ministry of External Affairs and the research scholars, of course, and other practitioners, uh, as well as, you know, uh, uh, there are people in the international organizations for them uh, uh, but uh, i also looked at uh, the areas where this collaborations uh, between the countries collaboration in the projects like a trilateral uh, sometime in india japan and asean or india uh, japan and us how they're going to work together to in case they go into development of port, port facility in sri lanka or some other projects in in the southeast asia so this is uh, what i have discussed in in my book you know, briefly uh, and hopefully um, uh, you know i will pick up some of the you know const you know some of the blue folds or what i could not co cover well uh, here in this book and maybe i can work further uh, in coming days so i think this is uh, from my side uh, professor chaturvedi thank you very much thank you very much professor day i think you have been very modest while talking about the ambit and ambition of your book. Because uh, I think one of the remarkable contributions of this book is connecting the thoughts. Because what happens is that sometimes we get so much uh, focus on the trees, on individual uh, stopovers, if I may use that word, that we lose a sense of the journey. We, we, we lose that macro view, you know, holistic view. So as I was going through your sections, uh, I could see how the way in which you connect the dots and then you encourage others also to connect the dots. So thank you for that. And I think the time is just right to bring in the maritime dimension and turn to Captain Parmar. Because if we go back to the journey, it starts 91, 92, uh, India starts looking east. 
it is also a time when india starts slowly overcoming that very unfortunate ocean blindness uh, i have always i have always been uh, saying this that had in there had in there acknowledge the fact that it has always been continental and maritime it's not it's not in the binary as a matter of fact the binary did lot of damage to us because as uh, ambassador jay shankar has said and as uh, professor pardesi has argued in his book indo pacific has always been there you know it was it was one system in so many ways with the exception of the cold war years when we had this partition the partitioning effect of the cold war cartographies so we were looking east but our looking east stopped almost at the andaman nicobar islands but we saw that as the journey began in 91 and we traveled uh, all these points that you have mentioned on page 4 of your book which is the timeline you know that we have given i was very tempted i'm very tempted to ask uh, captain parmar that when he looks at it from the maritime lens because after all ocean is a medium that forces you to think very different because as uh, professor day has brought us in his book to the question of sub regionalism which i thought was one of the another great contribution of the book highlighting the importance of sub regional scale i was wondering how captain parmar will describe that journey from the maritime lens you know which also includes the naval very important naval uh, perspectives so over to uh, you uh, captain singh thank you professor chaturvedi and satyasat ji thank you for this invite and prabir i must confess i was always planning to read your book but this inclusion of me in the book discussion forced me to go through the book twice over actually i found time once to read through and second to skim through on the important parts i i think it's you it's a it's a tremendous work which has been put into the book and there are a lot of templates that can be borrowed and modified to extend beyond what uh, into what we call the indo pacific and prabir i quite like the your last lines actually of uh, some page 335 the time is right for india to establish a strong economic partnership with southeast and southeast asia and other indo pacific countries so essentially there is much more that needs to be done because in a way we have just stopped at around asean though you do talk about the far east which is a very thin part of chapter where you bring in russia but as i say picture abhi baki hai dost you have another book to write and you have i think a window of opportunity <laughs> to get into indo pacific but getting back to where professor chaturvedi asked me to take off uh, on uh, the issue of maritime i am a sound believer that all maritime nations of the world are neighbors it does not matter whether you are in the indo pacific or you are in the caribbean right because the maritime domain is all pervasive one the issues that emanate from the maritime domain the baselines are the same the only difference are the peculiarities of the region that drive the nations to act in different uh, methodologies or approach it from a different point of view and i'll explain that as i go on by and by so i thought i'd put this down and i've said this quite often and i'll just repeat it once again is that all maritime nations are neighbors doesn't matter where you are because you share the same international medium the same issues that emanate from the maritime domain but the peculiarities are region wise and i'll come to that as i said a little later so first of all let's look at if you look at the maritime domain and i fully agree with professor chaturvedi and all the writings that, that this indo pacific has always been in in vogue may have been known in different terms or viewed from different lenses for example first of all let's look at the acceptance of the term indo pacific visa v asia pacific there is still some time to go before the term indo pacific overrides asia pacific because the moment you speak of asia pacific and let's say i look at it from the lens of the us then i would say that i would more or less be looking at the region of the indo pacific which is malacca strait and east of malacca strait so that is where the main focus has been for a very long time and even some of the writings that emanate from various countries today still look at the asia pacific in that lens 
So if we are to look at the, uh, what is the Indo-Pacific, then one is that you need to have the acceptance of the idea. And of course, it is more or less, to my mind, it's a geographical region. And I think our prime minister put it correct when he said, as far as India is concerned, it is from the east coast of Africa to the western shores of the America. Now, that is 50% of the globe. You look at the quantum of nations who are uh, there, and you look at the quantum of economy that is there, and you look at the whole issue. And when you look at most of the conflicts post-World War II, they have been factored in and around in the, in the Indo-Pacific, in, in a way. And if I were to say that let us stretch the argument and say that let's add the Persian Gulf as part of the Indo-Pacific, then I think you have much more than 50% of the ongoing instability and conflicts that affect not only the Indo-Pacific, but also the maritime domain. Because problems in the maritime domain have a habit of spilling over for the simple reason is that you have the maritime domain which is available to all nations who have the capacity and capability to extend their tentacles much beyond their immediate neighborhood. And that's an aspect which India has been doing. And I'd like to state to this effect that I quite like the, uh, the manner in which we started the discussion that the immediate neighborhood has now spread onto the Indo-Pacific. And that's something we have to acknowledge as a nation. Mm -hmm. And which is the extent to which we need to modify our approach to various nations. And uh, so there's a prerequisite to look at the geographical extent. And do not expect that everybody will agree with the uh, concept of Indo-Pacific. Probably, if you remember East Asia Summit in February, there are divergent views which exist within mm -hmm. the region. And uh, so, therefore, a consensus-based approach, approach on matters of mutual interest and binding co co cooperative mechanisms would be the bedrock of any approach or strategy that a nation would like to delve upon when going into Indo-Pacific. And one example I'll give you is the Germany, who has recently come out with Indo-Pacific guidelines. So, when you speak of the Indo-Pacific, and I'll, 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 I'll labor on this point for a little while, is that if you say Indo-Pacific, which all nations are you looking at? If you remember the argument that the US had that back to Asia and then said we were always an Asian nation because they've been here since the 18, uh, whatever, mid 1800s when they took over the Philippines from Spain is one issue. France is a resident Indo-Pacific nation. And of course, you see it by the manner in which it, is, it has its deployment of forces and of course, it's French nationals in the Indo-Pacific. United Kingdom, in a way, is also a resident, I would say, a nation of Indo-Pacific. But should it leave Mauritius, then, of course, or sorry, Diego Garcia, would it remain an Indian Ocean nation? And therefore, would it remain Indo-Pacific nation is yet to be seen. So you have these various nations who come in. There are uh, uh, nations with observer status in the plethora of platforms across the Indo-Pacific. And if you look at Iora itself, you have a number of observers, nations with observer status who have an interest in the Indo-Pacific. So if you look at all this, you are looking at more than 75 to 80 percent of nations who are involved in the Indo-Pacific. So your numbers simply grow. Your matrices for engagement simply increase. Your diplomatic endeavors become that more complicated. So it, it has to be a very measured approach and a step when you look at the Indo-Pacific as a whole. Having said that, so let us look at uh, the basic thing is that the Indo-Pacific is too large to be looked at as one uh, morphic geographic region. So the simple reason is if you uh, look at it in sub-regions and then sub-sub-regions, I'll give you the example that each particular region, I will, let's, let's talk about the Indo Indian Ocean region or the Persian Gulf and you look at, say, uh, Western Pacific or you look at the North Arabian Sea or you look at the Bay of Bengal. There are peculiarities in each of these sub-regions. And the main peculiarity is that each of these smaller regions or sub-regions have degrees of animity, of amity and animity between nations. If you look at the North Arabian Sea, the example I can give is India, Pakistan. A lot of mechanisms, a lot of political maneuvering, a lot of relationships delve upon Indo India, Pakistan. In the Gulf, it is Saudi-Iran relations. Along the east coast of Africa, you'll have different dynamics. So these are defining factors that delineate, delineate a nation and its peculiarities, which itself will impact on the maritime environment. And therefore, though, as I said, the baseline may be the same, but the approach of nations would be totally different than that. And then, of course, in your immediate neighborhood, your neighbors will understand your sensitivities, your security related issues much better than a nation who is far away. It's it's 
it, it's basically it is an understanding. For example, India Sri Lanka have a better understanding of security relations than I would say perhaps maybe India and Singapore would have. Because with distance, that understanding changes because the peculiar peculiarities change. But yet, there are certain common factors. And therefore, one, the first and foremost common factor, if you are to look at the Indo-Pacific, is what is the respect of the international laws and conventions and understandings that are at either a bilateral, multilateral, or at a global level. So these need to be formed the bedrock of your relations between various nations, whether you are pegging it at a bilateral, trilateral, or multilateral level out there. Therefore, the next common factor in so far as the maritime domain concerned is freedom of navigation. It's a much abused, it is a much used, it is an important aspect that nations need to understand that if you are to navigate on the maritime domain, then the respect for freedom of navigation has to be there. And therefore, if you respect freedom of navigation, you do not have the right to say to any nation that you cannot traverse these seas. That's an understanding that needs to be understood. And more important than that is the capacity and capabilities of nations. Each nation has got a certain capacity. Each nation has got a certain capability. India, in a way, in the maritime domain, has the strength core competency is on capabilities. Capacities come a little uh, after that. But when you look at cooperative mechanisms, you have to look at the strengths and weaknesses and work upon them so that when you work together in the Indo-Pacific region, you have a positive and a sum total outcome, which is positive. And therefore, you need to support each other, identify capacities, capabilities, build upon them. And this is where I, and before that, uh, I just would like to refer to what Professor Chaturvedi said was the return and rise of Asia. Now, that's an important aspect. We've been speaking for a long time where the uh, fulcrum of uh, global economics has shifted to Asia. How much of that has been accepted is yet to be seen. There are problems in various uh, FTAs, and Prabir is the expert, he's the economist. I just like to defend the economy of nations, but that needs to be looked at in uh, in a very higher degree out here. So uh, the next is, so therefore, if you are to look at the Indo-Pacific region and you to work out whether it's on the political arena, the economic arena, or simply addressing non-traditional threats of a certain commonality which affect nations, then I will borrow from the kingdom of Bhutan what is called the happiness quotient. And therefore, if you are to look at a happiness quotient, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific total, therefore it needs to be the sum total of the issue of promotion of stability, ensuring security and, enhan in, and enhancing peace in all the various smaller sub-regions, which I just gave as an example. You can look at it in, in any which way you like. And here I would like to point out that the Bay of Bengal and Wimpec is one model that can be looked at. I, I think BIMSTEC has done a lot of commendable work. It's looking at blue economy. If you'll remember the Dhaka Declaration, Prabir, we had a chat on it some time back. There are templates that are coming out of BIMSTEC. I think there is time for BIMSTEC to start looking at maritime security issues so that it's an overall strong sub-region of the Indian Ocean itself, in a way. And therefore, it can be copied and templated across the board to various nations. And you must remember, that BIMSTEC also includes landlocked nations. And I come back to the point that landlocked nations, as per the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, also have the right of access to oceans. And when you look at nations whose economy and very existence is dependent upon the import and export of material by the oceans, it means that they have to have friendly relations with their neighbors so they have access to the seas. And therefore, your landlocked nations also get included. Let's get back to the example of Iora. So my question I ask nowadays is that, is it time for Iora to start including landlocked nations also for the simple reason? Is there the right of access to the sea? And therefore, by extension of that, blue economy also, also means a lot to such landlocked nations. And therefore, that is where, Prabir, when you look at your northeast sector, which you have spoken about, even ASEAN, you must remember that there are landlocked nations in ASEAN. So there's an FTA with them. How will your how will your material move back and forth? So we need to have a better understanding of it. And that is where the maritime blindness issue comes into play, that there is a need to activate maritime awareness even in landlocked nations out here. So there are various platforms that we can look at, actually. 
I given BIMSTEC as one example. Uh, again, I'm going back into sub regions because I, to my mind, that's a nice way of understanding how the Indo-Pacific can be worked on as an agreement or a consensus of nations to work on. You have the Indian Ocean Rim Association and the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium in the IOR. Uh, my argument and the NMF argument has always been that they need to work together. IONS will look at the maritime security part, IORA will be at the political. So if you look at Sagar, which uh, we say is a conceptual level for uh, security and growth for all in the region, the region was never specified. It's a template. You pick it up and put it anywhere, but you need to have policies on ground. So therefore, if you are to marry the two issues of the political and, of course, maritime security, then you need to look at platforms. And, and examples I can give you is in the Indian Ocean region, I've given you IORA and IONS. In Western Pacific, let's put it at the East Asia Summit in the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. In so far as Southeast Asia and maybe that whole uh, mid area of uh, between the IOR and uh, the Western Pacific is concerned, you can look at ASEAN, ADMM Plus. There are a lot of uh, security related exercises that are run through all these issues. So, therefore, when you look at, you need to push for certain issues. And here I would like to introduce the Indo Pacific Oceans Initiative which needs to be pursued. And that, I think, is, Prabir, is something that you can look at when you look at maybe your next book for the Indo-Pacific. There are seven areas of cooperation. Security, ecology, resources, capacity building, resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, trade connectivity, and transportation. Now, when you look at all the platforms that I just mentioned, you'll find that all these seven areas of cooperation are covered. We just need to dot the I's and cross the T's and interlink them together. And in this manner, then you will be able to actually link up with, uh, for example, the policies of other nations, whether it be South Korea, the Southbound policy, or Japan's outlook, or even ASEAN nations. These are commonalities of seven areas of cooperation going to be looked at. And Praveen, my last point is also, and there are various other issues. Just one is that, uh, for example, your humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. At the Indian Ocean region, we are developing standard operating procedures at the IONS and the IORA level. Given the pandemic today, lessons are still being learned. I think it time is ripe to come out with a standard operating procedure to combat pandemics also. Let's get working on that as a first step and then extend it beyond the immediate neighborhood and across into the Indo-Pacific. But do remember, when you look at the Indo-Pacific, it is not only act east. We need to look west also because Indo-Pacific, from our perspective, starts from the east coast of Africa. And that is sometimes, to my mind, a little neglected area. And therefore, we need to focus on that. And with that, Professor Chaturvedi, I think I have uh, will wait for the discussion. And I look forward to uh, good engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Pilmar. Uh, looking at the watch and mindful of the fact that we should soon be going to uh, a general QA, Q and A uh, session, um, but I'm still very tempted to ask one uh, one more question to both of you uh, and uh, seek your uh, insights. You see, in Professor Day's book, uh, I think one of the most important chapter that I found was on Northeast, uh, and um, the point again revolves around the notion of connectivity. What do we mean by connectivity? It has a Janus face. Uh, it looks inwards and it looks outwards. And sometimes what happens is that it forgets that there is an intersection, that the concept of connectivity also has to be worked out on a frontier where the boundaries between the internal and the external become very fuzzy. Border regions also become actors in their own rights. And as you rightly say that if you look at the resource potential of Northeast, which again is not a homogeneous category in the sense that even if we use the label Northeast, the diversity within Northeast is also very beautiful and, and it calls for a very nuanced understanding of what connectivity uh, is, is all about. So uh, I, I wonder, Professor Dave would like to reflect on, on how does he look at the future of connectivity in India's even look East, Act East and Act Indo-Pacific policy. Unless and until our entire understanding of Northeast, our approach towards Northeast, which you rightly point out in your book, undergoes a change. For, uh, for Captain Parmar, uh, you see, the concept of scale, region, sub-region, uh, is al also very inclined or tilted, biased towards the continental understandings of, of relationships, intrastate, interstate. And as you rightly said, that when it comes to the ocean, 
it's a world ocean and in world ocean when you are looking at all these flows and mobilities the concept of scale also becomes very skewed in a sort in a, in, a, in a way professor day rightly tells us that you need to approach connectivity with humility in the sense in terms of scale you have to realize that all along the scale all along the scale we have to rethink the question of connectivity right from the local even now to planetary uh, scale we are looking at the tipping points and the planetary boundaries in the context of anthropocene so the envelope of imagination has to expand and we also know that when we talk about connectivity we see a mismatch and that mismatch or that juxtaposition rather than mismatch is the cognitive distance and geographical proximity sometimes the places which are very near to us geographically like the other side of the binocular they become very distant because of the lack of trust so in maritime domain we know that confidence building measures uh, are have also been extremely important and we we have also been talking about uh, naval diplomacy so very quick reflections uh, uh, from i think both of you uh, i'm sure will generate further questions in the minds of our listeners so over to you uh, professor day first and then captain parmar some reflections uh, on these issues that i have raised thank you uh, uh, thank you professor chaturbedi uh, this is the book you know i could uh, collect uh, for my office you know i had uh, here uh, on hmm, Uh, that is a section on act east and north east and uh, most of the papers are here the chapters are on that act east north east and primarily it, it talked about talks about uh, connectivity uh, aspects uh, between the uh, rest of india and north east and then the beyond now you ask the questions uh, that what is the you know future of this india's great connectivity Uh, program that's being contemplated at the moment. Um, to me, the connectivity that uh, we have been talking about, you know, this is a purely, you know, uh, point of view of uh, bringing the markets together. Uh, if you look at uh, in past, you know, in, in you know, um, and what we have today, only only the uh, the program uh, and the projects have changed. Uh, otherwise the colonizers you know uh, who came to the great land uh, it is a kind of an building a connectivity to their headquarter and here so that you know there could be more transactions and that transaction part we we have a different color and different nomenclature which i don't go here so in today's contemporary world when we talk about is india's connectivity program in different directions which you you rightly mentioned that but i think this is going to change once you have you know the multilaterally some programs that we do uh, where we when you talk about the world connectivity improvement that's happening through several other multilateral you know agenda that we we don't discuss now and to substantiate the several global programs we also go into sub regional the regional or maybe uh, inter regional programs that's up there in bimstack in bbi and sar asean and if you look at a common theme for all them i picked up that there is a common program is which is basically building the you know nation closing the coming the nations together through the connectivity program which is the only common thing i found there are many other areas and connectivity means both the physical as well as you know non physical social cultural like that in one minute that what we are and i think my pure my personal view is that what's going india is going from here you know when connecting northeast with you know in the eastern or far, you know, far eastern as these programs that india has been doing some of the projects those will be completed and this will you know it will not stop here it will rather you know get a momentum because the indian economy uh, at the moment yes everyone is in because of the pandemic we are you know all the recession we will come out of it and then there will be recovery maybe in the 5 to 6 years time there will be you know we all will come back and with an 
a different, you know, uh, their demand will be there, different uh, kind of a supply. And, uh, in, and from the supply point of view, this great transportation linkages, maritime or land, they will be again, you know, taken up in, 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 a, in a guitar way. That's my view. And the Northeast India is certainly, you know, going to benefit out of it. Uh, but benefit is kind of a narrow word, you know, when you talk about benefit, advantage, uh, etc. But I think not this is is a getting in, included, you know, this is an inclusive policy that's government has taken. Uh, so, so for that, there will be many local need and that need will be in demand, this demand, the need will be taken care of when we bring the, the cross border uh, kind of a business network which in economists they often call the value chain linkages those are also coming up you know and this will be more and more so to, to in short or to conclude uh, that i'm in that way i'm very optimist when you talk about northeast and act east or you know on the connectivity programs there is a greater scope for you know uh, our northeast and part of india to get it involved and that's what the policies in at the moment and in Delhi, uh, very correctly, you know, they, they have been, you know, maneuvering. Uh, and I'm sure that this is most, you know, I've seen it, that this has been welcomed by many of the Northeastern states, Assam, Manipur, Tripura. And uh, as we go along, so these programs will get a better shape. And uh, both the North, Southeast Asia or East Asia and our rest of the India and Northeast, they will all will be benefited out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So uh, I'll pick up from where um, we spoke about where uh, Professor Chaturvedi said concept of scale. And therefore, if we're looking at economies of scale, one of the defining factors is efficiency of any economy of scale. And when you look at connectivity, and especially when you are looking at trading between markets, and here I'm, I'm open to correction from experts, is that to my mind, there is a need to avoid overwhelming of markets. And there is a need to avoid overstretching your own resources and capabilities. Then only you can look at perhaps a good trade balance or a trade deficit equation. It may not become zero zero, but at least that is something that can be uh, strived to achieve so that you have better connectivity between nations and so far as export and import of material goes. And having said that, yes, of course, I agree with you. Proximity within the area itself is uh, of, say, of markets. And one example I can give you here is uh, uh, trans uh, shipment hubs within um, South Asia and stretching on to Singapore is that if Sri Lanka is also looking at transshipment hubs, we are also looking at transshipment hubs as part of Sagar Mal and you already have Singapore there. Then, of course, you are going to get into what is called a possible conflict of interest, whereas there should be a healthy competition. So I don't know how, what is the solution here, whether FTAs or an understanding can bridge that gap, but this needs to be looked at because then you are overstretching your own capacities and capabilities and therefore your uh, returns will not be commensurate to the investments which are made. This is just one example I can give as a non-specialist economist, but I, I think it needs to be looked at. Insofar as trust is concerned, it stems from, uh, of course, how relations between nations are. And one example is if we can get over uh, avoiding conflict and uh, look at healthy competition, then I think we're looking at a win-win situation insofar as connectivity is concerned. Uh, CBMs are a good idea, but uh, if I speak totally from the point of view of uh, traditional security issues, then there is a need for CBMs to be followed across the board between both the nation. I think I, I hope that is what you are referring to, Professor Chaturvedi. And then, of course, CBMs are CBMs. I mean, it is between two nations, and therefore, it is for those two nations to sort out their uh, agreements and their understandings insofar as CBMs are concerned. I think I'll stop here and we can wait for the question and answers. Yeah. In fact, one has already appeared on our screen, uh, which I thought was a very, very interesting question. Uh, it has always intrigued me, you know, uh, how do we add more maritime awareness to landlocked areas? Uh, and I think uh, Captain Parmar did make a reference to it, but I'll leave it to him uh, to elaborate uh, on that particular point. Because I've also been very intrigued from, as a political geographer and somebody interested in geopolitics, you know, the importance of socio-spatial consciousness. 
uh, I mean, people do talk about Admiral Mahan, but they forget one very important point that he made when he talked about elements of SIPA. Correct me if I'm wrong, Captain Parmar, where he talked about national character. And I think by character, he meant consciousness that India can become a truly maritime nation when every Indian thinks like a marina, you know, in the sense that looking at the, but I will leave it to the two parallels. I mean, I will leave it to Professor <laughs> Diane. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you know, it's very surprising that many landlocked nations are more aware of, are more maritime aware and are more, uh, what I would say, uh, knowledgeable about blue economy than a lot of coastal nations. And I, I always give this example is that we I, we often go to talk to uh, foreign diplomats at the Foreign Service Institute here in Delhi, where they conduct courses for foreign diplomats. And I found that uh, countries like Malawi, landlocked, but blue economy awareness, unclos awareness, amazing, because their their existence is on the ocean. So they understand this factor more. In fact, we learn more lessons from landlocked nations insofar as blue economy and unclos is concerned than we ourselves do, because they look at it from a different perspective. But getting back to the question that was asked is, how do we add more maritime awareness? We need to engage such nations more. And I get back to the question that I have now been asking for some time, that is there now a time to include landlocked nations? into Iora. Yes. That is one way of getting uh, more awareness from them. And then it also will enhance the connectivity issue which comes from there. So that is what uh, I, I thought I'll, uh, I hope that answers the question. But it's still a long road to go. And uh, let me also add something to it before we come to Arun, Arun's questions. Arun, Arunim, sorry, his question. That it's not necessary that all coastal states are maritime states or they are oriented enough. So I think that is another challenge that we face, that uh, it is also very important to map out the geopolitical orientations of what we call the Indian Ocean Rim states. Uh, and I still remember that when I went to Malta and I saw those colorful boats, those colorful boats uh, symbolize not hope from the ocean, but fear from the ocean, given the long standing history uh, of the of of the island of Malta, you know, they always looked at the ocean as as a, as a frontier from where the invaders came. So I think uh, it is it is important that uh, we uh, this has to be addressed. I think also at a very fundamental level of education that right from the beginning uh, we have to have a curricula uh, ably supported by social media and so on, which makes us realize the growing importance. Uh, of the uh, of the maritime domain on the face uh, of the globe. And I think the question that we see on the screen is also very interesting because it says very rightly, we can take a clue from the membership of Nepal and Bhutan in BIMSTEC. Okay. And I think uh, so thank you for this comment because it also reminds us of the obligations the coastal states have under the law of the sea convention. Uh, and that also raises a very important question of the transit rights. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that. So, looking forward to more questions on the screen. I, I'd just like to add in one more term here. One is the national yes, character yes. Professor Chaturvedi you mentioned. The other interesting term I've come across is called the maritimity of a nation. Uh -huh. So, that this is by a gentleman called one of the many Kohens who write in the US. So, it's, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. concept that, enhance, uh, that speaks more about the national character of a nation, that the maritimity of a nation is important insofar as maritime awareness is concerned. So right. we need to build on such issues. I just thought I'd right. bring that out. Right. Absolutely. Uh, we have another very interesting question before us. To really have uh, Indo-Pacific come together, is it economic first or politics first? I like this question a lot. <laughs> Thank you for this. It's a very prov provoking question. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, at the moment, lots of politics, but uh, we are gearing up with an economics as well. So to me, the, the quick response is that we need both uh, economics and politics together, you know, yeah, to complement each other. So, so in the Pacific, we just, it, it is, you know, just, we, we have just started. 
so and uh, we have been thinking about how to add in economics in the whole uh, Indo-Pacific move. Now, let the other countries who have introduced their vision report on Indo-Pacific, you know, several of them now, already they came out their Indo-Pacific vision. So let them reach a consensus. And uh, then maybe we can look at a kind of a track one uh, arrangements coming up. And then once track one is, you know, uh, taken up, then of course there will be line up, you know, line up corporations, including economics. So without economics, of course, it will be difficult to drive over a long time. So economics is very important and it will be it is there already and maybe presently at at is a kind of an politics which are being you know uh, being discussed at the moment yeah thank you let me let me add, add to this if i may uh, you see if we are reminded of uh, prime minister modi's shangri-la uh, keynote address at the shangri-la dialogue and also his Sagar speech. When I was looking at it from a IR theory point of view, I found a very fascinating hybridity. As a matter of fact, you see that it is not the binary of economic and political. Social and cultural aspects are also very, very important. Correct. Um, and uh, uh, because if we don't do that, particularly when we are, we are just having this discussion in the middle of the pandemics. And uh, I think one of the greatest challenges that the pandemics poses before all of us is social in character. Even if we use the word social distance, we are, what we are talking about is physical distance in a very narrow medical sense and not in terms of social distancing. And I think uh, we have seen in India's vision of Indo-Pacific a very clear emphasis on not being caught up in this binary between economics and political. Both are important in their own way. But certainly, I think the call of the day uh, is to, uh, to think very differently and very innovatively. And I'm very tempted, if you, if you permit me, please, to quote again from the book by Sri Jay Shankar, uh, the subtitle of which is Strategies for an Uncertain World. It's a very small paragraph, but very important one. He says, in this uncertain world, if there is a point of agreement, it is that the salience of alliances is decreasing. It is equally apparent that the old fashioned military rivalries are giving way to more subtle competition for influence. The future is to get nations whose interests are aligned or even overlap to work together. That would mean agendas and conversations with a more open mind and an appreciation for what each player can bring to the table. This trend is visible already in naval exercises, strategic consultations, or infrastructure projects, unquote. Uh, Captain Parmar, do you have some, some reflection to add to? I, I would, I would, I would totally agree to it uh, for the simple reason that uh, we are now known as the first responder and the preferred Pacific in a way. And uh, to give you an example, the uh, mission-based deployments that the Indian Navy naval ships are uh, when they say are sent out has enabled us to actually come to the aid of nations uh, uh, almost immediately. Uh, if I look at say the earthquake that hit Indonesia. Sometime a couple of years back, we had two ships who were transiting the area. They were immediately told to divert and head towards uh, Indonesia and render assistance. The, uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it? the cyclones that hit Mozambique is another example, or the assistance we have given in the pandemic to our uh, island nations, or the methodology we followed for taking out civilians from unstable areas. We have not only taken out our own Indian uh, citizens, we have also taken out uh, foreign citizens. And I do remember a figure of 514, I think, uh, uh, internet uh, citizens we took out from Lebanon, way back when uh, the, we had that Hezbollah war uh, between the Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. So we have been there and it's something we do. And we do it without even, uh, we do it freely. And we do it with an open will, which I think is most important for a nation in the maritime domain to be recognized as a growing maritime power. Our exercises with various nations is increasing. In fact, we've signed a number of logistics agreements with several countries now mm. and across Indo-Pacific. And uh, there is much more uh, road to be covered 
there is much more uh, avenues to explore as of yet because uh, when you look at the maritime domain the biggest threat today is non traditional threats and non traditional threats impact all nations equally and one example i can give you is piracy is the manner in which we combated piracy of the horn of africa it took time for the international cooperation to settle in but once it settled in we are seeing the results even today so we are committed to addressing non traditional threats in a regional manner and expanding it outwards into the indo pacific thank you very much we have a question from uh, samarth mathur again a very fascinating question did we see that in south asia some areas were not developed because of fear of intrusions by neighbors are technologies like uh, for uh, for uh, what is it for ir IR, for ir telecommunications blue economy among others can overcome such intrusion fears professor day well in in south asia uh, like some of the pockets in in the northeastern part of india or maybe central part of uh, india or somewhere in bhutan or afghanistan landlock countries you know where uh, there are you know some some areas or some regions you know the regions in in in, in some pockets you know of course there are fear of intrusion in the in the, by external powers i can make it. but all uh, you know those areas where access to basic uh, in, in amenities or facilities are really limited healthcare public health in particularly education uh, relating to issues related to climate change environment and like that you know so so i think uh, that for ir industrial revolution for i r relating to i t or artificial intelligence big data analysis like that you know my guess is that this could be you know properly utilized if uh, that would bring the benefits you know as we have seen in the covid and nineteen area those are also utilized you know somewhere and larger uh, people of you know, of the country or the region they are getting benefited i think th this this is a good interest interesting point and we, we see this kind of a new ideas you know can it can be taken up by the countries or the secretariat who is running you know particularly the region you know like south asia or or maybe the like yeah uh, uh, captain thank you captain parmar uh, can i take you to this question please given that the definitions are very different how do you see for uh, pairing up I, I recently wrote a short article before the uh, Quad meeting in Tokyo for the Institute of India Australia engagement, and uh, in that I had said that you know somehow Quad has come to be linked with the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. If you go back in history and you say 2004 when we said four like-minded nations got together to combat tsunami, that was well before even Indo-Pacific was was being uh, debated upon. And therefore, it came out in 2007. So if you are to look at how the quad is panning out, you have to look at it from uh, the lens that it is not a security arrangement as of now. Let me very qualify that very clearly. It is just that you have four nations who think in the same manner, who have a lot of common interests, who have a certain aim in mind, who are getting together to talk together. The outcomes are yet to be seen. In fact, uh, 3rd November, I think, will be a defining uh, date as far as Quad is concerned. And of course, the policies that the new Prime Minister of Japan follows, although the first, uh, the, fourth, the, the last Quad meeting was held in Tokyo, which has obvious implications on that. So if you look at it, as I said, uh, you may not come to an agreement on the Indo-Pacific, but if you have an agreement on which way you want to go together, for the betterment of whichever region or sub-region you're looking at, then you are walking in the right direction. And to my mind, the security aspect should be the last to be discussed or brought in. First, you have to have a common base or a common grid. As I know, it's, it's a very loose, uh, I would say, it's a very loose cooperative mechanism going on. And if you want to actually look at how the court will pan out insofar as security is concerned, then we have to look at how the Malabar series of exercises is taken forward. And I'm fond of quoting this in 2007. We had six navies together. That is the Quad Four, plus Singapore and plus the United Kingdom. 25 ships at sea. And I was fortunate. I was commanding the Sea King's Squadron as I embarked on the Indian carrier, and it was a sight to behold. We never had anything like that. 
So if we can slowly evolve in that way, then the security aspect of the court may be talked about. But as of now, I think the best is to just look at mutual interest and see which is the way to walk ahead. And not to always link it with the Indo-Pacific. You can have the court anywhere you want in any case. Uh, thank you, Captain Pramar. And I, I just to add a footnote to what you said, and that too in a spirit of agreement and endorsement. Um, see, it's 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 very it's very obvious that India's vision of the Indo-Pacific is much broader and deeper, and it has to be. Historically, it has been the case. Uh, it's not that India is not looking south. India is not looking north. India India's geographical centrality. Uh, makes it imperative for India or views from India to be multi-directional. So that will continue to happen. Now, given that Quad is coming together, is the, is the idea of coming together for a more open, what we say, more inclusive, rule-based uh, order, maritime order, where we have seen some very serious challenges, particularly in South China Sea. Unfortunately, we have seen a very, very aggressive, irresponsible behavior. Now, given that India's vision goes right up to the African shores and the Middle East and so on, Quad always creates an opportunity for issue-based, sector-based cooperative efforts. And I think this is, this is how I think India would like to see it, that not just centered on the Eastern Indian Ocean, but also the Western Indian Ocean, going towards the Southern uh, Indian Ocean. It's, it's, I think it's, all, it's also a very normative concept. Now that brings me to a next question, which I think is, is flowing from this normative uh, uh, bent. Would you agree that if we need to evolve cultural narratives that tie the Indo-Pacific nations together, if yes, given such a diverse set of notions, what could be its direction? I think it's a very, very important question. Uh, because we have been talking about soft power, we have been talking about uh, the the Indian Ocean world. So I think uh, if I may have may 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 take the have the first take on this question. Yep. I think what we need to do is to overcome the historic dementia. Uh, we have to go back into the history and be reminded of that wonderful Indian Ocean world where the order came not out of homogeneity, order came from diversity. A diversity of which the entire region can be proud of. So I think it is very much possible uh, that you can have a dialogue of what you call civilizations and the cultural narratives, not necessarily with the intention of coming at a consensus, but with the intention of having a better understanding of each other. Which, which is, I think, the fundamental bedrock of any kind of cooperation. So, Professor Day and Captain Parmar may like to uh, yeah. add a bit of insights. Uh, quick, uh, quickly, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that sometimes you know we have a big grand idea, but not necessarily when you come to uh, you know project like Indo-Pacific. You don't have you you have to include everything, uh, the culture or civilization links are, of course, these are they are very much. But but when you run uh, Indo-Pacific projects, the, if, and if you prioritize, the foreign office of Indo-Pacific countries will pick up only those which are the common challenges, you know, the common basket of the interests. So if the countries they think that there should be a dialogue for or some discussion on the culture of civilization linkages, absolutely fine. But I think, you know, at the moment, you know, we uh, we are discussing in the when it is in the Quad or in the Quad Plus or in the Pacific, something on which Captain Palmer and his office organizations have been talking about, or you as the geographer, you know, uh, that trade, the common maritime challenges, common maritime security challenges, those kind of things. And of course, uh, as I said, that if it is, you know, taken into a track one then uh, and then you know countries have to decide whether they will bring as well the cultural aspects even if it's not there that doesn't mean that we undermine the culture or civilizations so so that's it from my side thank you 
I, I, I totally agree with what both of you have said. And we have to go back into time. So when you look at the cultural linkages and the historical linkages that go back so many centuries, we talk about uh, Cholas, we talk about uh, connect with Southeast Asia. You look at Fiji, we have a population there. No, and as as a nation, a lot of our population was, I would say, if I use the word, exported for use by uh, the colonial powers in various parts of the world. And when you look at it, we have approximately a huge strength of uh, PIOs uh, the world over, and a lot of them are Indo-Pacific. So you have those cultural and historical linkages. You, you uh, religion was a big factor. Look at the Buddhist links we've had with various nations. You look at the extent of uh, where mythologies are the same, you know, your figures in, uh, are the same, the way you words are the same. So that is the way which we need to start to strengthen this historical cultural linkages. And I'd like to uh, uh, say here that we looked at Project Mawson quite some time back. I think it's time to re-energize it and get it going because that is one of the most powerful soft power tools that we can actually come out about with for binding with Indo-Pacific. And I, I, Praveer, I told you we need to look west also. You look at uh, Kenya, Tanzania, the railroad there. I mean, you see, and you look at Uganda, the amount of uh, people we have there. South Africa, we have a link. I mean, it's when you start looking at, uh, at it from a sociologist, sociologist point of view, the scope is tremendous. Thank you so much. I think the next question is for you again, <laughs> Captain Prabhat. And uh, let me also tell the audience that Professor Day also talks about in his book, even going beyond the current understanding of the Indo-Pacific, if I'm not mistaken. So the question is for you to take, Captain Parmasa. <laughs> you know, often when we look, we look at talk about the Indo-Pacific, once in a while, you always have this one question that comes out, what about Russia? Have we totally forgotten Russia? <laughs> so uh, it's important. Uh, Russia is also an Indo-Pacific power. Let's not forget that. I mean, it's, it's not only a European power, it's also an Asian power, it's an Indo-Pacific power. And therefore, we need to take Russia on board also. Our links with Russia go back so many um, years, decades, you know. It's, and our relationship with them has uh, stood the test of time in a way. If you look at it that way, it's been one of our most strongest uh, support nations at one point in time. But then, of course, relations, uh, the world environment has changed, but we need to look at it and I, I totally agree that Russia and Japan are only two countries that India holds. Well, we have bilateral summits with many nations, but we need to get uh, how to get Russia in is going to be a very, very uh, careful uh, method because, uh, uh, well, you know, the state between uh, relations between Russia and Europe as of now, and especially with the US are there. It's going to be a very fine balancing act for us to do. But I totally endorse the view that we need to get uh, Russia is slowly entering into the Indo Indian Indo Pacific. Its relations with China, you have ships visiting South Africa again. They are going to be here for the long haul. We learn. We have to learn how to live together with everybody, and that's the way it is. Thank you. Looking at the watch, I think it's time for me now to uh, turn to Mr. Datta. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, maybe uh, some closing statements by. Uh, by you, uh, Professor Chaturvedi, would be very much welcome. Well, I... uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know we have uh, almost run out of time, but let me say that what an honor, what a privilege it has been for me personally, and a great uh, learning experience. Um, I would like to congratulate and thank Mr. Datta the executive director of Asian Confluence, that true to Confluence, I think this wonderful organization has been bringing together um, diversity of viewpoints, experiences uh, in a very dialogic format. And uh, I think uh, we need more such in initiatives, institutions, and more such conversations. I would like to also congratulate Dr. Praveed Day and also thank him once again for, for writing a book that I'm sure will, will live forever uh, in terms of its richness, in terms of the issue areas that have been raised. And as I said at the outset, it's a very good example of how a book offers you or exposes you to a broad canvas of practices and then forces you to think through them seriously. 
systematically and theorize them differently. I think one of the key takeaways uh, for me out of this conversation is again the need for a more global social science, for a more uh, open, inclusive dialogue, uh, and more critical thinking about the frontiers uh, in a metaphorical sense, where the binaries between the internal, external, the binaries between the narratives like sea power and land power are questioned in favor of, in support of a more uh, hybrid world where we have greater tolerance uh, for, for diversity of viewpoints uh, and narratives. Because uh, that is the need of the hour as we face the challenge uh, of the uh, pandemic, keeping the social alive, keeping political healthy, and going for the best possible manner, the economic recovery. So I think this conversation has also brought us, made us more sensitive to the very important role of scale. I, we realize out of this conversation how important scale is, both in terms of its ethical connotations and also in terms of its political connotations. So another key, away, key, key uh, takeaway for me personally is the emphasis that Professor Day has placed on a scale which I think has got marginalized from time to time, and that is the sub-regional scale. And Captain Parmas, as I said, I always continue to admire him. And I think he has, he has made us aware of the fact that when you look at the earth from the ocean, when you look at it from the maritime domain, sometimes we, are, we forget that there is also a commonality, very deep ecological integrity of the world ocean. Mediterranean, Indian Ocean world, they all are the outcomes of different socio-economic characteristics and experiences and so on, as Captain Parma reminded us. And it is, now is the time for us to really look at the intersections, look at the confluence, uh, question the binaries, and continue uh, our conversations uh, in, in the spirit of, uh, of, of a, a democratic uh, dialogue. So this is all that I would like to say, uh, Mr. Datta and thanking you and your team and also Alak, uh, who yes. has been helping us uh, a great deal. And I'm also very, very grateful to my co-panelists, Professor Day and Captain Parmar. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Professor Chaturvedi, for, for uh, you know, in the, uh, you are, a, you are a very celebrated academic of our country and, and you are a wonderful teacher. And I learned so many things that, that, you, that you said today. And uh, I think we all did. Uh, so thank you very much for that uh, wonderfully summing up the whole, uh, whole, uh, whole idea. And at, at the confluence, at Asian confluence, we, we see our geography as one being linked by waters and ideas. That's what we say in our tagline so so um, you know your presence uh, captain uh, parmar uh, really really uh, brings in such an important dimension of the of the maritime aspect where which we, we tend to really really forget so many times uh, uh, and uh, and all this happened because of the book that uh, dr day wrote and uh, we we have a wonderful context to discuss such an important point and on that note, I think on behalf of all our viewers, the entire team at Asian Confluence, and on my own, uh, looking forward to engaging further with all of you. And a, a very, very big thank you for sparing your value. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.